Hello and welcome back to Data Analysis and Visualization. I'm Javita Christie and in this video I'm going to explain to you decision trees and random forest algorithm. So let's begin. First of all, what are decision trees? So let's take a look at this data on the top. It's a simple scatter plot and it does not contain um, a lot of data points as you can see. So there are some data points which are blue and there are some data points which are yellow squares. So to separate the classes, we don't necessarily need a fancy hyperplane. So this is something that is done in a support vector machine algorithm. Um, which I haven't explained in any of the videos, but maybe in one of the future videos we could discuss that. So you don't need to create a line or anything to separate um, this data, a hyperplane, but you can use uh, decision trees to do that because you can see just from the data itself, you can see very clearly that um, whenever X is greater than three, then uh, all those data points right here are yellow. They are all yellow boxes. And when X is less than three, then they are all right here um, in circles. It's a blue, blue circle. So um, less than three is blue class and um, greater than three is yellow class. So that's quite easy to tell just by looking at the data. So let's see how you can represent this as a tree. This is what it will look like, what you see up here. This is our original data, all of it. This is the branch that we are creating, uh, which is X less than three. So all these blue points, they go in this section because they are all, as you can see, less than three. And there is this uh, partition created here at three. So if it is greater than or equal to three, it goes to yellow. You can, of course, use the great uh, equal to sign uh, with less than, with the less than sign, that's also fine. So you can decide um, if it is equal to three, then should it be blue or yellow? So this was very simple and a very simple way to create a decision tree. So it's basically just defining rules um, that can help you to classify your data or, or rather to cluster, to form clusters if you want to do, if you want to uh, form clusters, you can use decision trees and just uh, create rules and form those clusters. What happens if you have three classes instead of one? So you can see here there are three classes. So even then you can see there are some um, there are some uh, similarities with the two class one because you can see if it is uh, there are three partitions, but you can see that if data is if a data point has the x coordinate greater than three, then it is definitely a yellow class. And if it is less than three, it can be either blue or it can be green. And that is decided on the basis of the Y coordinate. If Y coordinate is greater than three, then it's green. If it's less than three, it's blue, um, given that X is less than three. So the same thing is represented here using a decision tree. Um, this root node contains all the data points. Um, then we are dividing them uh, based on X less than three, X greater than or equal to three. If it's greater than or equal to three, it is yellow class. If it is less than three, then all these green and blue are merged together. If you want to separate these two, then you just have to do Y less than three. If it's less, it is blue. If it is greater than or equal to three, then it's green. So fairly simple way of uh, classifying or clustering data, as you can see. Now let's take a look at this algorithm and I'm going to explain to you in the simplest way possible. So it won't be very fancy with a lot of um, formulas and all. It's going to be uh, very much uh, in, in English written sentences. So now as we saw in our multi-class decision tree, we need to find a way to define these splits so that we, we find the best splits to identify our class. So we have several classes forming in our data set. And the, the key here is to define the split. Okay, from where exactly should you split, um, should you create that split so that you know the, the classes formed are correct. 
Secondly, there's the added problem of finding the first split or the root because you're starting. You're just starting and you have all the data points. Where exactly do you make that first split? Should we try every possible split to determine which is the best one? That can be exhaustive, but that's essentially what happens in a decision tree algorithm. You try each and every split, find the best one and go with it. So now here, uh, it's, it's the same kind of data set, but little less points. You can see there are four blue, three yellow. And um, what I've done is for each data point, we have created one split. So you can see this blue one is in one split uh, at 0 0.5. Um, the second blue one is between 0.5 and one. This one's between one and two, two and three. This is right here. Uh, 3 and 3.75. This is between 3.75 and 4.5, and this is beyond that. So this is the way we have created splits. So there are six, um, yes, there are six splits over here, okay, because there are seven data points. So we have defined six possible splits given our data that separate each point. Now, how do we know which splits are the best? Okay. Because what we need to find is out of these six, which is the best one? Should we take this? No, because then um, this blue one is going to be classified as yellow. Should we take um, this one? No, because if we do that, then this yellow is going to be classified as blue. So we have to try out all these splits and see which is the best one. And how do we know that? By Gini gain calculation. This is, uh, this is a formula, very simple one to find out which split works the best. So what is Gini gain? Firstly, we calculate Gini gain and Gini gain is nothing but the impurity for the whole data set, which means um, if you are saying that this split is the one that you want to go with, then um, not this one, this one's the best one, but if, you, if you're saying that this is the split you want to go with, then how how good is that split because obviously other than this split right here every other split is going to cause errors for example if you choose two then um, there would be an error that uh, this blue one is going to be classified as yellow so that means this split is performing some clustering some classification but it is impure and that's why Gini gain is used to calculate or, or sort of quantify this impurity of the split that you have uh, uh, that you have selected. So this is the probability of incorrectly classifying a random selected element in the data set. Now, as you can see, if I were to select, um, say, this 0 0.5 as my split, uh, do you think it would be, uh, could you compare that with 2? which one's better and which one's worse. Obviously, selecting two is much better than selecting 0.5 because um, when I'm selecting two, at least um, six data points are correctly uh, classified. But when I'm selecting 0.5, then only one data point is correctly classified. Uh, so that means there must be uh, some probability. Now this Gini index gives you that probability. If I have selected 0 0.5 as my split, then what is the probability that out of all these data points, I'm going to pick one and that one is um, essentially going to be, uh, is going to be incorrect, is going to be incorrectly classified. So obviously if I have selected 0 0.5, then uh, this blue is correct. These three yellow ones are correct. But if, I, if I'm picking something from these uh, three, then it's going to be incorrect. So this, this, uh, Gini index or Gini gain is calculating the probability that if I've selected this split, then um, and if I pick a random data point, what is the probability that it's going to be incorrectly classified? Okay, so here uh, in the formula it is G initial because uh, initially we're just calculating uh, the Gini index in uh, as, a, as an initial value. And you'll see as we as we calculate it further. So here in this formula, which is uh, sigma i equal to one to c, c is number of classes, 
and we have pi into 1 minus pi. pi is probability of randomly choosing element of class i. Okay, so there are two classes, so we have to repeat this formula twice since um, we have i equal to 1 to 2. So let's see. So once again, here's the formula. Um, let's fill up all the values. C is equal to 2. Now, probability of an element of being of class 1, um, class 1 being, let's say, blue class. So how many elements do we have in the blue class? We have um, four elements here. So that means um, this is going to be 4 by 7. Total, we have seven data points, so 4 by 7. Probability of uh, the second class, picking a data point from the second class is 3 by 7. And just insert all these values into the formula. And you can do the calculation. So you have G is equal to P1 into 1 minus P1 plus P2 into 1 minus P2. And just replace all the values there. Um, you'll get 4, uh, 4 by 7 into 1 minus 4 by 7 plus 3 by 7 into 1 minus 3 by 7, which results in 24 by 49, and that is 0 0.49. That is our initial Gini gain. Now let's split the branches into two sections. So we're going to split it into right and uh, left and right sections. And uh, this is the section that we have selected, which is the 0.51. Okay, this first, uh, the essentially the first split. If you do that, then our left branch contains only one ball, which is um, blue. So if you're calculating just the Gini gain for the left side branch, it's going to be zero because um, because there is uh, not, there is no other yellow ball, so that you, you have not, no probability to uh, calculate. So it's just going to be zero. Okay, uh, it will be zero because uh, we are applying the same formula, and anything you multiply by zero is going to end up zero. So this is uh, left is g left is zero. G initial was four, uh, zero point four nine, and now for the right side. So on the right side we have um, three blue balls sorry, three, three blue circles and uh, um, three yellow circles. So the probability, three yellow squares, sorry. So the probability of the right side, that is uh, G right, the Gini gain is three by six into one minus three by six because there are total six balls and three are blue, three are yellow. So one minus three by six plus three by six into one minus three by six, same which uh, gives us 1 by 4 plus 1 by 4, which is 1 by 2. So that is that, that means it's a 0 0.5. That is our G right. So we have three values now. We have G initial, which is 0 0.49. We have G left, which is 0. And we have G right, which is 0 0.5. We can now determine the quality of this split by weighting the impurity of each branch by the number of elements it contains. So you just have to find out how many elements it contains, and then you can calculate the impurity of each branch, which means you can examine each split that you, that you have proposed uh, to see how impure it is. So let's see. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to find out for the, uh, say, the first split, which is right here, you can see. If you're trying to find out if this 0 0.5 split is good or bad, then what you have to do is just do one by seven into zero, which is G left. One by seven, because on the left side of the split, there's only one data point. And six by seven, because on the right side of the split, there are six, so six by seven into 0.5, which is right. And that gives you three by seven, which is 0 0.5. Or three. Now you can remove this impurity from the Gini gain uh, initial value, which was 0 0.49, and uh, 0 0.49 minus 0 0.43 would give you 0 0.06. So essentially, higher this value, the better the split. So um, you're going to do this this whole calculation again for each and every split that you have and calculate this uh, Gini gain value for each and every split. 
and the one that has the highest Gini gain is going to be the split that you will use. Now, calculating Gini gains is how we construct our decision tree. And if we have three or more classes, we just do the same with the other classes to form our second level of nodes. So first, you're going to just create the first level by using the same procedure that we did. And then to create the, this level, you're just going to apply the same formula to uh, this, this node right here for these values. So you're just going to go on doing that and creating a decision tree. We only stop doing that when our Gini gain, that is G impurity minus the impurity of our branches is zero. This is because in our last leaves, there won't be any more classes to separate. So once you have reached here or here and you apply the Gini gain formula, you will notice that the uh, G impurity minus impurity of um, any of the branches that you have selected is going to be zero. And this is because we are at at um, at the leaf node, and um, the data points are all belonging to the same class. Now, what are random forests? So, once you know what a decision tree is, then random forest is going to make much more sense to you. So, random forests are simply a um, are simply the output of multiple decision tree classifiers. So that means, um, I'm going to explain that to you now in a bit. So you have multiple decision trees and all the decision trees together, um, they give you, uh, when you put them together, that's a random forest. So for random forest, we sample with replacement from our training data set, then train our decision tree on N set of samples and we repeat this T times. Note some of the temples will be used multiple times in a single tree and because it's a random random forest. So now what exactly does that mean? So a training set is essentially the set that is already um, labeled and classified. So you already know that this is blue, this is yellow. Okay. And you're going to, from this training set, you're not going to use all the data points. You're going to randomly pick some data points. And um, that sample which you're picking is going to be a sample with replacement, which means once I pick a data point, I am going to put that same data point back into the pool and pick another data point. So there is a pr probability of uh, picking the same data point again. Now, once that is done, once I have picked some, uh, some data points, my sample is ready, then um, I'm going to perform the decision tree algorithm on this sample and create a decision tree. So let's say this is my first decision tree. Now, what do I do for the second one? For the second one, once again, I'm going to pick some data points at random and generate another decision tree and so on. So you're going to do that for a set of N samples and repeat this T times. And once that is done, then all you have to do is just cost, ask everybody to cost a vote. So how does that happen? Um, first of all, if, if you have a new data point, the, the whole purpose of decision tree or random forest is just to make predictions. So once you have classified your training data correctly, now you want to test your data set. So you, you want some uh, data point which is not known to your um, model and you want to introduce that data point and find out if that is supposed to be uh, blue or supposed to be green. So assume there are two classes, blue and green. So is your data point blue or green? So what would you do? You'll ask the first decision tree to answer this question and maybe that tree says blue. Ask the second one says green, third one says green. And if you have 10 decision trees and seven of them are saying green, then green it is. So you're just taking a majority vote, okay? You're just taking a vote and whatever is the, whatever the majority says, that is true. So that's how random forest works. And that's why it's very uh, effective because um, you're making so many decision trees at the same time. It is slightly slow, but um, you don't really have to code that much nowadays because of all the libraries available. I'm going to show you the code uh, in a while. 
uh, I'll just uh, finish by telling you that this process of using multiple classifiers to find the most common output, which is the majority vote or average if it's regression, is known as bagging or bootstrapping. Okay, this is also called bagging or bootstrapping. And now uh, we are going to implement a random forest for some data set that I have. It's fairly simple and won't take long. So let's do that. So this is once again uh, my Jupyter notebook. And this um, here we are going to use this data set, uh, which you can get from this link. I will link it down below. So this is the data set. You can uh, see how it looks here. Um, it contains the height and weight of certain number of people. I haven't uh, calculated the length, so that's OK. And um, here the third label is male. So it, it, if it is one, that means the person is male. If it is nothing, that means uh, or zero, that means it's a female. OK. So this is what we are trying to find out here. Is a person male or is a person female? So that is what is given here. It is all males. And if you just scroll down and see, these are all females. So these are the heights and weights of uh, different people. And what we are going to do with the data set is to first of all perform a random forest algorithm uh, and classify it. And after that, we are going to uh, feed some values to it and just to see if it correctly identifies that as male or female. OK, so now. Um, first of all, we are taking NumPy and pandas libraries we are importing as usual, and this is a fairly, fairly simple code. Actually, uh, this is the file which is available on GitHub. Uh, I, I will share the link and then we are just reading uh, this file storing it into df and this is we are printing some values which are the first five values from there just to see what it looks like and then just plotting the data okay let me run this um, next we are going to plot our data so this is how the plotting is done using seaborn and matplotlib i think i've explained quite a bit of plotting in my uh, previous couple of videos, so I'm not going to go into details here, but you can see um, the orange section is the male section, the blue one is the female section, and you'll notice that there is some cluster formed, you know, there's this blue section which is right here, and the orange section which is uh, way over there, so you can notice that there is some cluster away, there are two clusters, okay. Um, I think I ran this today. OK, that doesn't matter. Um, now we are just going to get our re data ready to prepare it for training uh, in sklearn. To do that, you're going to use the ilock function. Now, this function basically is used so that you can uh, specify the x and y values. Y would be essentially the label that you want to use. For example, in this case, I want to classify my data as male, female. So that would be the second column of my uh, data set. So that's why here you can see two. And zero to two, which means all the values to be considered while you're going to train the data. So these are the three columns to be considered. And that is zero to two, so zero, one, and two columns. Now you're going to split the data into training set and test set. Usually in most uh, data science, um, experiments uh, programs we do an 80 20 split which means 80 percent of your data is used for training and uh, 20 percent of the data is used for testing the model that has been trained in our case in my case i'm just going to take 0 0.3 here so this is uh, sklearn.model selection it has this um, this up uh, this function here train underscore test underscore split so it allows you to split your data set into two parts, training and test. So there are two coordinates, X and Y. So that's why we have X train, X test, Y train, and Y test. Y test. And um, here you have test size. So test size is going to be the 
size that you want to mention so if, because it's point 0.3 that means uh, your training is 70 percent data and testing 30 percent data and uh, random state equal to zero is you may skip it if you want now this random if, if you have already specified the test size then the random state is going to be zero if you do not want to specify the test site and want that to be something that's randomly selected then you can specify that over here now we can um, import the random forest classifier from sklearn like this okay let me run this okay just importing import that into uh, into your jupyter notebook and then we are going to do the classification so to do that first of all uh, you're going to create an object of random forest classifier by writing this code right here okay the name of the object is ran for underscore clf and once the object is ready then you're going to train your model to train the model you just have to do uh, the variable you just created object dot fit and pass the training data set which is x train and y train that is passed and then you can perform your predictions so to do the predictions you're just going to do once again random forest underscore prediction um, this is another variable that we have and we are just going to use the variable we used earlier the object we are going to do that object dot predict x underscore test so now because this model has been trained it can now test these values you could now do anything you would want with these values it will return to you you know bunch of uh, zeros and ones one for male zero for female so you could plot it if you'd like okay uh, what i have done here is just um is just passed my own values okay so i just went ahead on google and searched for um, the heights and weights of some um, of one female actress and uh, I mean of one female actor and one male actor so and then just uh, fed the data right here to see what it shows now these two lines of code which you can see which is np.array that is done because I need to create an array out of this to um, to know whether to to predict whether somebody somebody is male or female i need to specify the height and weight so two values need to be given as i have done here but i do need to reshape it to be uh to be able to perform a prediction using this classifier and i have explained this thing a bit when i explained a linear regression earlier uh, we did something of this sort back there as well so np.array is going to create that array and then reshaping is done with minus one and two. I'm not going to explain this since I have already uh, talked about it in one of the previous videos. And then we're just going to predict the gender. To do that, just pass this new variable array that you've created, pass it and print the gender, which is coming zero. Now the height and weight I've used for uh, an actress, Amelia Clark, I found that this is her height, this is her weight. Okay, uh, so 157 meters is now this data that we have is uh, height in inches and weight in pounds. So I had to convert that, um, which I have done. 52 kg is 114.64 pounds, as I have mentioned here. Okay and the height is 1.57 meters we could convert that as well so meters to inches this is 1.57 okay that is 61.81 hopefully that's what i have mentioned yes so that is done and um you just print the gender as you can see it's showing zero was showing zero it still shows zero so that means it's a female and um, let's try it for a male actor so i'm going to go for arnold schwarzenegger i tried it before so okay this is uh, he is 1.88 meters let's just put that here meters into inches 
1.88 uh, we're just going to put it here 74.01 and uh, the weight is it's already given here in lb so i can use that uh, let's just go with 235 okay so 235 and that's it i'm going to run it and it shows one which means male so it has correctly classified that and you could play with it and try a couple more uh, examples if you would like so that's it for this video i'll be back with the next one so i'll see you there and thank you for watching Thank you.